Hello and welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture Series. My name is Caitlin Scully and I'm a science communicator at Birch Aquarium. Today's talk continues our focus on Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego's multifaceted work at UC San Diego. A multifaceted work on our changing planet. As many of you know, Scripps Oceanography researchers are tackling tough questions about the impacts of climate change on oceans, ocean ecosystems, and our global society, as well as sharing how science can inform climate change solutions. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Ram Ramnathan, who will speak about Bending the Curve, Climate Change Solutions, his global initiative to help solve the climate crisis. Introducing Dr. Ramnathan is challenging in that it's difficult to select which of his myriad of awards and accomplishments to highlight. Dr. Ramnathan is a distinguished professor of atmospheric and climate sciences at Scripps Oceanography and the Edward A. Freeman Endowed Presidential Chair in Climate Sustainability. He's been elected to some of the most prestigious national and international scientific organizations, including the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, among others too numerous to list. In 2018, Dr. Ron Nathan, along with James Hansen, was named the Tang Laureate for Sustainability Science. Dr. Ron Nathan is well known for his many major contributions to science that have changed the way we understand and study our planet. These include the discovery of CFCs, and the fact that they are a major greenhouse gas and quantifying the amplifying effects of water vapor on CO2 warming in the atmosphere and the prediction in 1980 that the global warming signal would be evident in the year 2000, a prediction that was verified in 2001. His important work has led to numerous policies, including the formation of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition by the United Nations. Dr. Ramanathan's scientific successes are matched only by his contributions to communicating climate change impacts and solutions to the public. Recognizing that climate change disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable, Dr. Ron Nathan has dedicated tremendous energy to making real world impacts on climate change, teaching us how everyone, including individuals, communities, businesses, and religious leaders can take action and bend the curve of climate change towards a more sustainable future. I am deeply humbled and beyond happy to welcome Dr. Ram Nathan. Let's bring him in and say hello. Hello, Dr. Ram Nathan. Thank you for being here. Hi, Kathleen. I'm delighted to be here. Excellent. Are you ready to jump into your presentation? Yes, why not? All right, excellent. So for everybody who is watching us uh, this evening on Facebook and YouTube, please go ahead and submit your comments and Dr. Ram Nathan will be taking a few questions at the very end of the presentation. So go ahead and submit those and we'll get to them a little bit later on. All right, here's your presentation and we're so excited to hear what you have to say this evening. Thank you and uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about one of the most important problem, now I must add, just next to the pandemic we are all facing. If you're in California, climate change is almost always linked with fires. So let me start with that. Uh, if I can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, a photo of the image of the sun in the sky I took uh, last week from my backyard. So why is the sky red? Simply because uh, the Valley Fire, which is east of San Diego, uh, it's still uh, remnants of it are still there. And it, when, it, when you burn trees, leaves, and any organic matter, you give off soot. This is technically called black carbon, most of it known as uh, black soot. And this soot is so tiny, they scatter the blue and the green light and the violet away from the sun. So what you see is the remnants, just the red. Let's see uh, the next one. Uh, that is still about 6.30 in the evening. The sun was about you know, half an hour from setting up. 
and you can see the red, fiery red sun. Again, it's because between you and the sun are this black carbon soot, which took away the blue and the green light. So let me uh, tell you the connection between climate change, global warming, and fires. So if I can have the next slide. So this shows the statistics. Uh, it's interestingly, we have already gone beyond that. It says two and a half million acres. We are close to three million acres. It's a record which was set uh, last week for California. And we know similar things happening for the North in Oregon and Washington State. And how bizarre is this record? It's just in the last 20 years. 25 years, the acres burned us increased by a factor of two to three. Okay. So let me take you to the next one. Uh, so this is actually a, a picture of the Valley Fire. <clears throat> and I show an equation there, uh, which has a death grip on everything that's happening. What the equation is telling you on the left-hand side is the vapor pressure of water. It increases exponentially the temperature. So this is the rate at which water is evaporating from the soil, from the tree trunks, from the leaves. This evaporation is happening every second of the day, every minute, every hour, every day every month, every year. The rate at which it's increasing is about 6% per degree of warming. California has already warmed by a degree and a half. In principle, then the evaporation is, has increased by about 10%. So even if the rain come falling on our head is the same year to year, the evaporation is increasing, so things are drying out. That's one of the fundamental reasons for the spontaneous combustion of when the fire is lit, it goes to thousands and millions of acres. So that's happening in the West Coast. Our East Coast colleagues would have, uh, as, you know, friends and family on the East Coast would have a similar issue with the same equation. If I can go to the next one. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So hurricanes. So why are hurricanes getting more intense? Same thing when the atmosphere is warming. Because of more evaporation, the atmosphere holds more moisture. Again, that's gone up by 6 to 10%. And this has been measured worldwide, increasing the moisture. Some places for 5%, some places 6 10%. And, you know, this was all theory about 30 years ago. And I was curious, and in the graph on the side you see, uh, a student of mine and I downloaded all the satellite data and plotted the water vapor in the air on the vertical scale and temperature of the ocean on the horizontal scale. And we were shocked to see the actual data showed this monotonic increase in the water in the air, just following that equation, within few percent of that equation. So in, in spite of all the controversy you see in climate change, we understand why the weather is getting more extreme. It's been now simulated by models. We can understand it theoretically, and it shows by data. So if we can go to the next one, please. <clears throat> so let's ask ourselves the question. The planet has already warmed by about a degree Celsius, which is roughly about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. We are all used to the Fahrenheit scale. If we don't do much about climate change over the next 10, 15 years, there is a 5 to 10 percent probability beyond the mid-century, which is just about 30 years away after that, 
the planet could look like this. This is basically showing areas of drought. So you see the entire Amazon, the entire Southwest, including California and Oregon, the entire Mediterranean we would love to visit, South Africa, Eastern China, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, you know, astronomers think of Earth as in being in a Goldilocks zone, just at the, uh, no, I wonder at the previous slide still, Caitlin. So exactly, can we go to the previous slide, please? No, the slide before, the one I was talking. No, 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 you're going too far ahead. Perfect. Let's hold on that. No, no, the, the previous one. Kathleen, we have to go to the slide before. The one I was talking about. Yes. Kindly hold on to that. Joe, don't change it, please. Yeah. So uh, people talk about the Earth being in the right uh, Goldilocks zone at the right distance from the sun. So we our temperature is livable temperatures. But with global warming, our Goldilocks zone is going to shrink. And I, I'll touch on that later. So thank you, Caitlin. If you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, the key message I want to leave with you today, and that's what we're going to talk about the rest of the talk, it's not too late, OK? There are plenty of solutions we can put into action, but we, we have a decade to implement these solutions. But enormous investments are needed to accelerate the uh, implementation. That's going to require tremendous public support. And that's where those of you who are listening, you come into this picture as, as part of the solution. If I can go to the next one, please. So the first thing I want to mention to you is that climate change science is intensely data-driven. I am emphasizing this because this problem has become so political and so much misinformation. I myself was at NASA from 1974 for about three years and helped the engineers design this satellite to look at the heat budget of the Earth. More recently, after I joined Scripps, we uh, developed unmanned aircraft to measure the pollution directly with multiple instruments, with unmanned aircraft, with ships, etc. If I can please go to the next slide. Yeah. So, where where is this climate change problem coming from? Right. Let's talk about. Let's say after my talk, you get on the car because you have been trapped at home due to COVID. And you take a right and come back, okay? So you would have burned some part of the gasoline in your car. But what happens to it? See that gasoline is basically hydrocarbon, hydrogen and carbon. So when you burn it to get energy, the carbon gets attached to the oxygen in the air and becomes carbon dioxide. It is one of the most insidious environmental ecosystem damaging uh, gas we can think of, simply for one reason. Once you release it, half of it stays there for 100 years. And about 20% stays there for thousands of years. So why should we worry about it? What it means is that this thing is accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. So it is not inconceivable that the carbon dioxide which was released by James Watt, the British engineer steam engine, 150 years ago, we are still breathing it. It's still there. So how much, 
have we emitted since James Watt's time? Two followed by 12 zeros, tons, two trillion tons. And a famous Crips scientist, uh, David Keeling, was the first to record this increase. Thanks to him, we now know how much of this two trillion still, st is st still up in the air. Shockingly, it's almost a one trillion tons of carbon dioxide is above us, on our head, over our head. So it's covering the planet like a blanket, just like a blanket on a cold winter night, traps your body heat and keeps you warm. This blanket of carbon dioxide traps the infrared, infrared heat coming from the earth and the atmosphere and traps it sends it back and heats the planet. It's just as simple as that. It is basic quantum mechanics. It is basic molecular physics. There's nothing to escape it, okay? So if I can go to the next one, please. Thank you. See, until 1975, scientists thought it was mainly carbon dioxide we are releasing, which is heating the planet. Uh, in 1975, I was uh, uh, just finished my graduate study PhD. I stumbled on this major discovery that chlorofluorocarbons, these are compounds we used as refrigerants and propellants, you know, the spray cans. I discovered that they are about 10,000 times more potent than CO2 per ton. So that now, that whole field of non-CO2 has expanded. There are about six different such potent gases we are releasing. So the next one, please. Can I have the next one? Thank you. So you see, by 1980, uh, it became clear to me, we are dealing with a major, major problem. I didn't think it would become crises like this. And I said, if this theory is right, I need to know when we are going to see this warming and test the theory. So we did a statistical dynamical theory and made a prediction there was a climate model that if this warming due to CO2 is real, we should see this warming by year 2000. So let me show you next the uh, record. If I can have the next one, please. So this shows, uh, you know, planet surface temperature collected over tens of thousands of instruments and billions and billions of data set has gone into this to create this history of how the planet's temperature uh, changes. You know, planet goes temperature changes even without us up and down. So there are some cyclical stuff going on. But when we made this prediction in 1980, the planet was still cooling. And I know many of my colleagues thought I was crazy. And so it, you can see it was in the year 2000 when the warming exceeded what we call the background noise or the natural. Uh, so it was a, a, a spectacular confirmation of our theoretical understanding of how the planet responds to our pollution. So if we can go to the next one, please. Next slide. So using the similar set of approach, two years ago, I teamed up with two colleagues, one at Texas A&M, another here at uh, uh, UCSD, David Victor. And we made a prediction that the planet's warming, which is about one degree as of two years ago, will accelerate by 50% to one and a half degree in 10 years by 2030. We were again the first to make this prediction. And just last week, the United Nations released a report which sort of supports this. So what does that mean? When you go from one to one and a half, that's a 50% amplification. So in principle, if you if that equation which holds a death grip on this extreme weather would say well, everything we are experiencing, particularly droughts and fires would 
in, in enhanced in strength by about 50%. So what its implications are, I'll pick it up uh, towards the end. So if I can go to the next one, please. So one thing I want to mention to you uh, is that the skeptics argue, well, you know, our climate is always changing. It's cyclical. What is another one degree, what, one and a half going to do? The answer to that is first is they are right. Climate changes tremendously. So I'm showing you how the climate has changed over the last 60,000 years. What you see here is it was always colder. You have to go back to 130,000 years before you saw this current warm epoch. So the climate goes from cold to warm, cold to warm. Last 10,000 years, we have been in this warm epoch. It's called Holocene. What we are doing is heating the planet beyond the warm epoch. That's why it makes it unprecedented. If the warming goes to a degree and a half, that would be a planet none of us, no Homo sapiens, and no other species on the Earth has witnessed probably in the last million or years or more. So we are on a new regime. That's the worry. That's how to answer those who say climate change is cyclical. If I can go to the next one, please. OK. So enough of the bad news. So let me uh, address how do we solve this problem? And what particularly, what is the University of California doing? About four years ago, uh, let me just say, no, five years ago, our president, Janet Napolitano, the UC president, asked me to lead an effort to come up with solutions for climate change. About 50 faculty. Just overnight, I just started to send email, 50 joint top experts in all 10 campuses. So we coined our thing, bending the curve. I know bending the curve, flattening the curve is a big uh, terminology now with the COVID. And we came up with uh, 10 solutions to the problem, which is shown in the next slide. Thank you, thank you. So, you know, what we did was put our solutions under five pillars, okay? That's in the outer rim. The center one tells you what the science says, what should we do to control the warming, okay? And remarkably, they're simple solutions in principle. First is make the planet carbon neutral. Just switch from all carbon emitting sources to renewables. The second is there are many super pollutants. I talked to you about CFCs. And if you bring all these non-CO2 pollutants, they alone can cut the warming by a degree and we have technology to mitigate them. Just give you one example, soot, which comes up out of diesel thousand times more potent than carbon dioxide. But we have diesel particulate filters. Many cars now, in, in fact, most diesel cars in California have to have these filters. Third, remember I said there's a, we have put a trillion tons on, in the uh, uh, air already. We have to suck some of them out. We call it atmospheric carbon extraction and then energy efficiency. So those are what science tells you what to do. The problem is, how do we do it? We have technologies, but we are not doing it. So that's where this group identified societal transformation as the top solution set we have to do. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. I, after that, I had dedicated myself to the societal transformation. Let me share some of my stories with you there. So if I can go to the next one, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sorry, before I go to the societal transformation, uh, if you ask me, 
tell me the most important action we need to take. That again is simple, declare fossil fuel as outdated technology, okay? And switch to abundantly available renewables, solar, wind, geothermal, even nuclear. But we have to be careful. It's, we have to be people-centric. So before we declare fossil fuel outdated, we need to figure out how to provide alternate employment for the millions of fossil fuel workers who made our life pleasant, okay? So it's not abandoning people working in fossil fuels, it is abandoning the fossil fuels, okay? And people say who's going to pay for it, the air pollution fossil fuels kills millions and the lives lost is equal to about six, five trillion dollars each year, okay? So we are paying with our lives. All climate scientists are asking is, paid with dollars, not with your life. So if I can move to the next one, please. So why, why have we not take actions in, to bend the curve in spite of this overwhelming evidence? Our houses are burning. It's getting flooded, right? And we are losing soil for drought, et cetera, simply because I think at least in the US, climate change has become political. And we just lack the massive public support needed for drastic actions. So that's what take, took me to the path I'm on. So if we can have the next slide, please. So the first thing we are proposing is we have to create at least a million climate warriors. We have to educate our children, grandchildren who are in schools and colleges. Okay, and, and, and I find this beautiful saying by Confucius, who talks about if you're thinking of the long term, educate children. Okay, and uh, uh, so let's go to the next one. So what we at the University of California have created is an education protocol which had been field tested and can be taken to the whole world. So first is we created a digital textbook. You see that image, Bending the Curve, it's open source. It spends only two lectures on science, which the rest is all on solutions. And again, written by over 25 top experts in the 10 campus California system. Now some of our authors are on Yale, Cornell, etc. Using this, we created a hybrid in-person course. We've been teaching it last three years. Now this course is being taught in all uh, campuses of the UC system. It's being taught in Stockholm University, Taiwan, and then state universities in California. It's basically, taped lectures, the students are expected to listen to the lecture and come to the class to discuss solutions, okay? The learning happens before you step into the class. And then we created that into an online version. And by sheer luck, that online version was released this year during COVID, where in-person classes were not possible, okay? So we were, we had already COVID ready with this. And then University of California, San Diego has created a MOOC, which is being launched just now. So anyone can take this course. The second one, next one, please. Next slide. Yeah. Obviously you've got to start this at the kindergarten to level. So I teamed up with the Dean of Education at UCLA and the CSU, several Vice Chancellors of Education, and we have created a new program for teaching K-12 teachers, UC CSU Environment and Climate Literacy Project. 
we met for nine months, created a working group, we have created a report, we have created a, a proposal to get there, and that's being now pursued by uh, UC and CSU to take it to the next stage of really developing a curriculum for K-12 students. I'm hoping in two to three years, it'll be taught in all the schools in California. Next one, please. So right now, what I'm thinking is, you know, America has got divided into two nations, in, 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 uh, not in practice, but in principle, and the two sides are not talking to each other. So I, create, I have assembled a group, and we are starting a program called Climate Education for All. This is not college level, high school education. This is for everyone, including those who have not gone into college, but we are mainly targeting skeptics, okay? So I'm partnering with religion for this. And if I can go to the next slide, please. So what I'm asking for is the teaming up between science, policy, and religion. So why do we need religion? This statement we released based on a meeting we organized at the Vatican and we briefed Pope Francis right after a meeting. And we concluded finding ways to develop a sustainable relationship with our planet requires ultimately also a moral revolution. Religious institutions can and should take the lead on bringing about such a new attitude towards creation. If I can have the next one, please, Caitlin. Thank you. So what is the entry point? And I, I'll tell you why I'm going to the uh, faith-based institutions. Our entry point is to address the ethical and moral issues of climate change or climate disruption, okay? And educate the public by taking the message directly through churches and other places of worship. Uh, next slide, please. Let me address the ethical issue. There are two things here, intragenerational equity. Uh, this is the problem I've been working with for the last 10 years. I see the world, uh, there are two worlds. Okay, I talked about two Americas. Now I'm talking about two worlds. The first world is inhabited by the about a billion people with seemingly unlimited access to fossil fuels. And they are responsible for more than 50% of the climate pollution. Compare that with the bottom three billion. I took a picture of this woman cooking my breakfast. She's in the Himalayas. And I was uh, the guest of her and her husband. So these, they lack access to any energy. All they're reduced to is burning wood. It comes at the great expense, about 3 million of them die every year from inhalation of the smoke. But when there is severe drought, severe flooding, and you know who's going to go down that cliff first, it's this 3 billion who almost had nothing to do with the global warming. So that's the ethical. The even worse situation is the next one, intergenerational. If I can have the next slide, please. So this is a thing I created to get people to wake up about this issue. There is a five to 10% probability, if you think of the plane as the planet's ecosystem crashing, about 50, 60 years. If I tell you that there is a one to 20 chance of that crashing, we won't get on, you won't get on that plane. But we are children, sending our children and grandchildren, they have no option to but get on that plane, okay? So if we can have the next one, please.
So how did I get into this? Uh, 10 years ago, when I turned 60, I was pleasantly surprised that Pope John Paul II invited me and elected me in person to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. It's an academy of about 70 scientists in the world, about a third of them are Nobel laureates. And you're selected not because of your religious affiliation, but just because of the science. That made me realize that church could be a power of taking this message to the people directly. So if I can have the next one, I probably have another two or three more slides, Caitlin. So we are uh, towards the end. So if I can, yeah. So we organized a meeting in 2014. And at the end of each of our meeting, we brief uh, the Pope. And this was about how to build a sustainable planet. So in this meeting, I, the Pope was too busy, so he met us outside where we were staying in the parking lot. So I had all of two minutes. So that's what I call it, a parking lot pitch. This was about eight months before he released his encyclical. I briefed him on the intragenerational and intergenerational moral ethical issues. In his encyclical, which is called Laudato Si for our common home, the Pope has one, um, uh, just a fantastic phrase. He says, the cry of the earth should be heard with the cry of the poor. It was published in 2015. So if I could go to the next one, please. So we formed this alliance and, and the Holy Father had a meeting for mayors and governors. I invited our governor to this and uh, it was really <clears throat> an, a, a, just a you know a game changing moment. And so many mayors and governors were educated on the imminence of this. We can go to the next one. <clears throat> So two years ago, we decided we are not able to persuade people that this is a serious problem. So we said we need to focus on the health. And so we had convened the top uh, physicians and healthcare providers, and it was co-sponsored by University of California, San Diego. And we released a book just three months ago called Health of People, Health of Planet, and Our Responsibility. And that book apparently published by Springer Book holds now a record for book downloads on the environmental category. So I am quite enthused about this because it shows we can now take this message using health. So how am I planning to do this education for all? Can I go to the next slide? Hopefully it's the last slide. Yeah. So our strategy is, you know, our team now uh, of this education for all team includes the CEO uh, of uh, American Evangelical Network. We have top Catholic leaders, and we also have Jesuit schools like uh, Creighton University in Omaha, and we have from Indiana, Notre Dame, uh, uh, and many uh, uh, religious-based institutions. And what we are thinking is that we would develop brief educational material, five to 10 minutes on each segments, and have them, have the preachers, community leaders, talk about this to churchgoers directly, reach out to them. And why do you think, why do you think, why do I think this work? I have now spoken in so many churches, I think close to about three to 4,000 people that have reached to. This is in uh, Nebraska, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and few other uh, states like this. And 
most of them, I just get general public because it's always organized by uh, the Jesuit colleges or churches. For example, in San Diego, I talked to about 200 evangelicals. Basically, what I do for them is unpack climate change from all the issues that divide us. I talk to them, it's scientifically based, it's imminent, we have to take action. And so far it has worked. So that's my game plan for getting more public support for climate change solutions. And again, don't forget, there are abundance of solutions to solve the problem. Caitlin, thank you for this opportunity. I am open for questions now. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ramnathan, for, for speaking with us today. And especially such an important topic as California and the whole West Coast is struggling with the direct impacts of climate change with our, our forests and, and areas burning. It's been such, such a challenge. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit um, about the argument that's going on regarding the impacts of climate change on our forests and on the West. Some say we just need to manage the forests better or do things on our part, or is, is human forest management the problem or is it larger earth processes that are causing these challenges, you think? I think, uh, Kevin, let me just say that I don't know enough about the role of the management or lack of management on the forest. And, but even if it's a problem, there are two problems we are dealing with. One problem is all the human management, human governance, which I said I know little about. And the other problem is the ecosystem is getting progressively worse, okay? So, when you reach that, you know, the management issue has been always there, right? It's not that we started the issue five years ago, but why is the problem getting worse? It has gotten worse in the last 30 years when the planet warmed by a degree. And we have made these measurements, warmer soil evaporates more moisture, okay? so. This problem, see the management problem is something, if it is there, it can be handled with improved management. But climate change, particularly when it reaches beyond a degree and a half, we have already lost about 10% of our forests. So you can ask me if we don't do anything about the climate change, when is the forest fire problem going to solve itself? I would say, yeah, it will solve itself when there are no more forests to burn. You can have the best management in the planet, but if you're lighting, drying out that forest, they need water. Water is going to be our most severe problem. So this problem, our state, I'm in fact talking, I talked to or some of the government officials about this, we need a longer term prop, prop solution. We are right now in a crisis management stage. We have to be because we are hit with COVID. We are hit with the uh, uh, fires and all the uh, issue of, you know, with uh, inequality and all that. So our, our government is naturally under crisis management stage, but it's going to take a bunch of experts a bottom-up effort, maybe UC can play a major role. How are we going to deal with this when the warming hits one and a half, two degrees and the fire situation is going to get worse? What, what's our game plan? It's very true. And, and I think we're all hopeful that this is definitely a reality check for a lot of us on the West. And we'll be forming that game plan from now on, hopefully. Um, we had another great question that um, came in that wants to know that with the success with, of working with, with religious leaders, have you seen any non-Christian um, or Catholic religious leaders kind of join in on your talks? You mean? have any non-Christian leaders, non-Catholic leaders join this? Yeah, good question. Yeah. 
I just want to make one point on the on the forest. Uh, you asked about management. Uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, thanks to the Professor Neil Driscoll, has created this amazing documentation of the fires with this network of cameras that would be a powerful tool for better management of our forests. Anyway, so that issue. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I have uh, worked with uh, Buddhist religion through uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and there are numerous efforts going on interfaith dialogue on this. In fact, next week, there is a global meeting I'm attending organized by United Nations. Uh, it's Islam, Hindu, um, Christians, Jewish. But you see, I'll tell you why I'm focusing on the Christianity. Because my thesis is this. We are not going to solve this problem if Americans don't join us. And more than that, if Americans don't take the leadership. So why is that? We have a lot of the technology. We have a powerful, powerful scientific basis. And also, we are one of the major uh, emitters of carbon. You know, carbon, as you see, it's like COVID virus. Infection anywhere would be disease everywhere. So emissions anywhere would be global warming everywhere. So even if California becomes zero emission, we are still going to suffer the rest if the rest of America don't join us. So with that focus, the conserv conservative part or the climate skeptics are apparently predominantly religious and they're you know Christian religion. So I'm thinking that that gives me an anger to reach out to them. And with this message of unpacking climate change science from everything else. That's really great. And it's it's very heartening to hear that, that religious leaders and, and many world leaders are coming together for this incredibly important cause. Now, um, our, our very last question is talking about kind of generation, different generations and, and climate change and climate impacts. I know um, many younger people are frustrated and not sure, you know, what the future might hold. Do you have any sort of message for like the younger generation with sometimes it can seem like doom and gloom is the only thing we see in the future. Is there any optimistic climate message we can give for those coming? Yeah, and Carolyn, I think that's why I put the, some of the our Twitter feed and the education course links there. Our course is designed to empower them that there are solutions, there is still time to solve the problem. And we address all the issues that people are talking about. Uh, you know, inequality, racial, gender issues, all of that are discussed in our course. And I think already if you ask me, what is the single most positive thing that have happened in the last few years to make me optimistic we're going to solve this problem? That is the youth movement. You know, the Friday for Future and uh, uh, Thunberg's movement in Sweden. And our campus, UCL alone, has a Green New Deal. So the youth has, is taking charge. But what I feel they need is we need to empower them with knowledge how to solve the problem. Otherwise, I'm afraid that in two, three years, it will peter away. So we have to empower them with tools to do. So uh, the youth hold the key to the problem, and I hope they don't lose heart. I hope so too, but I have faith that, that leaders like you and the team at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and UC San Diego and universities around the world, we're not gonna stop shouting from the rooftops that this is important. So 
we're so happy that you were able to to come and speak with us today. We've had a few people ask if we could put some of these links in the comments, and yes. we'll be sure to include these links in the comments for both Facebook and YouTube so that you guys can easily access Dr. Ramnathan's important work and this coursework. So one more time, I would just love to say thank you to Dr. Ramnathan. Thank you for speaking with us this evening. And um, this talk will be available on YouTube and Facebook for everybody to watch into the future. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Wonderful. So um, as we say goodbye to Dr. Ramnathan, I just have a few announcements for Birch Aquarium because Birch Aquarium at Scripps actually opens on September 15th, which is tomorrow. And we are very excited to open up uh, and welcome guests once again. Tickets for a specific date and time are required for members and guests to visit. And we have many new safety protocols in place for guests and staff to try to keep everybody safe. So we hope to see you at Birch Aquarium soon. Um, I would also like to take a moment to thank everyone who has supported us and is continuing to support Birch Aquarium. You have really ensured that important education programs like this lecture series and our new virtual classes for school and youth groups are able to continue into the future. Um, you've also helped feed and care for the more than 6,000 creatures that call Birch Aquarium home. We are so proud to be a part of the community and are really thankful for your support to make it all possible. If you'd like to make a gift to Birch Aquarium, you can do so at aquarium.ucsd.edu slash give. And thank you so much. And we'll see you in early October for our next lecture. Have a great evening. <laughs>